So hi everyone. Um, just gonna get us set, set up here. We're gonna start. Uh, maybe people will join. Um, but uh, happy to have the people here joining in, and um, hope this uh, webinar will be interesting for you as it will for me. Um, this is the first time I'm using this platform, so I hope it goes without any major glitches, um, and I'm sure it'll be fine. So uh, welcome to the Communities for Change: The Jewish Approach uh, webinar. Um, Basically, um, what I want to talk to you about today is about, obviously, communities um, and how they can make a change, but also talk about how these communities are actually a deep part of our shared Jewish con conscious and a really important tool for how, as Jews, as people, part of the Jewish people, um, can use communities to sort of make an impact and use it as a tool for how we want to change the world. Um, so without further ado, we're going to just uh, dive uh, right into it. So, hey, this is me, obviously. Um, so as you can see me, um, this is me when I was 16 years old. Um, about six years prior, I made Aliyah to Israel. I was living in a town uh, near Tel Aviv, and I made Aliyah um, from Houston, Texas, in the USA. That's where I was born and raised. I had Israeli parents, and we had a great, you know, Israeli Jewish community in Houston. It was really a wonderful place um, to grow up. And that was sort of my first taste of community. And when I came to Israel, I joined this youth movement. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with youth movements, but um, I would say at least for Israelis, um, about a third of kids and youth in Israel are part of these different youth movements. And I would say it's definitely the first place where I sort of started to learn about what it means to be part of a community. And I want to tell you a story, okay? It's a story about the youth movement I grew up in. And we had this kind of committee. It was um, a committee, like an outreach committee or like a committee for um, community engagement. And we had this like day seminar. Um, and they did sort of like a activity where they played out like a role game for us. And I want to share this role game for you because it was a very impactful moment for me and how I understand communities. Um, important thing, I said I grew up in Houston, Texas, which is important because as a kid, my parents sent me to uh, a NASA day camp, which was for me the coolest thing ever as a you know, seven-year-old, eight-year-old kid. And it really got me interested in space. And you know, I remember seeing this picture of like the, the Earth from outer space, and I thought, wow, the world is so amazing and big. And 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 I was shocked by how like you can see from afar and you can't see the humans, the cities. Um, and this connects to our story. So the story was like this: we were sat in a room, and our counselor came to us and he said, "Well." Um, Listen, let's play a role game. You're all uh, society living on the moon. Um, you came to the moon 100 years ago to build a perfect society, an exemplary society with uh, no pollution and with no crime and with solidarity. And um, you're building a really amazing um, society here on the moon. And one day you get a message from Earth that there was a huge war on Earth and there's a lot of poverty and violence and problems on planet Earth. Now, as a community, the dilemma is, do we stay and implement our, all our energy you know, and our efforts on our moon base, our perfect moon-based community, or do we send people to go work and help the community on Earth, which is no longer our community, but it's, they need our help? And basically, uh, I was really compelled by this dilemma, but also felt disturbed and annoyed. Like, how is it always building our community within, in contrast with building our community with, on the outside? I did understand as a kid why these two things contradict each other. Um, and so that sort of, you know, really, really got me thinking, um, this whole idea of what are the role of communities in the vast human sort of um, sense. And as I said, I really like NASA. That was something that I really was into. Um, and I even dreamed to be an astronaut. Obviously that didn't work out. Um, but 
I started to get into this idea of communities as an idea for change. Maybe I won't change the world from space, but maybe I'll change it here on Earth. So before I go forward, I want to talk a little bit about myself, introduce myself. My name is Barack Obama. I live here in Haifa. Um, I've been working with building communities and informal education <clears throat> for my whole life. And I've been finding communities to be a strong method for change. Ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated by the idea, how can people change the world? And for me, I found uh, my answer through communities. I worked in uh, several uh, youth movements and educational organizations and a lot of activist campaigns. Um, I was living in the US for the past two and a half years as an Israeli emissary for the Jewish agency. And now I'm working in Haifa and I run a local uh, an urban community renewal project together with the city and a few uh, government organizations. And I also work with uh, communities in the diaspora. I'll talk about that later. So I want to dive in again. Um, how do communities change the world? That's what I'm trying to talk about. How do communities change the world? How can they not only serve our specific needs, but how can they actually create change? Um, and actually, the idea of community is rooted deep in Judaism. Um, this idea of people coming together, but not only coming together, you know, in the sort of, I would say, even like very superficial way of a group of people living in the same, you know, area of the world. But I'm actually talking about um, a group of people who have maybe a certain idea together. And this is extremely Jewish, okay? So, for example, the minion, okay, a quorum of 10 Jewish adults. The basic idea in Judaism is that we have to have a community, a quorum of people to create, to do our basic religious, um, you know, services, our obligations. And that's a really interesting idea that's really deep in Judaism. Another example I want to bring, this is, by the way, a minion taken, a uh, picture taken yesterday in, um, Williamsburg, that even in times of crisis and corona, uh, people find their way to come together as a community. Another idea I want to bring in from Judaism about community is the term hakel. So hakel is a really interesting term. It refer refers to the biblical commandment. Uh, basically, every seven years, when the temple was in Jerusalem in ancient times, every seven years um, on Sukkot, um, the whole Jewish people was commanded to assemble in Jerusalem for a reading of the Torah by the King of Israel. Sort of like um, every seven years, we need to redefine what is our Jewish, you know, wide world community. Um, so that's also a very basic idea that in Judaism we have the idea of community. And this sort of went on, you know, even into more modern. Uh, ideas of what is a community. So for example, you know, we have the Eastern European shtetl, which even though Jews had no, you know, state of their own, they had no autonomy, they would congregate in these communities where they had like a really closed system where they would take care of all their needs. We have the kibbutz and the moshav, which is also an amazing um, idea of when, you know, the pioneers came to Israel, they didn't only decide to create settlements or cities or towns, they thought, let's create um, a sort of settlement or a town that's based around a community idea. Um, or the Hasidic movement, which is also a very important movement in the renewal um, of Judaism in the past hundreds of uh, years, which also uh, uh, was centered around the idea of building a religious community. Um, and you're part of sort of a religious, a religious community, a chatzer. So all of these ideas of communities are deeply rooted in our Jewish faith and our Jewish practices and our Jewish perspective on how the world works. You know, when we're talking about tikkun olam, um, it's not only an individual act, it's actually an act of community. And so now back to our story. Um, the thing that I was really, you know, uh, intrigued about is great. So we have all these amazing ideas of how to build community and a community is a great thing. You know, you have people that 
that come together, that you know, that live together, that work together, that have relationships and support one another. But how do how do we make change? You know, how do we actually make change in the world? And that's something that I thought a lot about, a lot about and was really like sort of um, something that I was, um, you know, really thinking of and worried about because I just didn't want to have a nice community of my own. I really wanted to make a difference. And that difference started to happen in 2011. Um, anyone want to ask any questions so far? Okay. Um, so basically in 2011 were um, the protests in Tel Aviv. It was the year where there were economic social protests all over the world, you know, starting in Tunis and going to Egypt and the Arab world and Israel and Spain and Greece and New York and the US and basically all over the world where um, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people came together um, was a very unclear message, but at the end, uh, sort of um, collective cry for a different world, for a world that they wanted to see different. And I want to share um, like my experience. So this in Israel in 2011, this was the largest um, protest movement in Israeli history. And one of the largest in the world, if you compare it to percentage of the population, um, the biggest uh, the biggest protest was half a million people, which at the time was almost 5% of the whole population arriving at one single protest. That's, that's huge. Um, and as the protest progressed, it became more than just a political protest for you know, equality or a just society. Um, and I wanna come back to a specific moment that I remember from, from them that really changed my perspective about it. So I remember a moment that I can't forget. One night, um, you know, we were at the tents um, and um, the whole Rothschild Boulevard um, was full of these tents, you know, just thousands of people. And I was with a friend of mine um, and he had a concordion and I had a guitar and we were playing Get Up, Stand Up, you know, Bob Marley for about 90 minutes and people just joined us. And then we met another friend of ours and we started walking up and down the boulevard and we saw this random like um, uh, modern dance show just happening there in the middle of the street. And then we sat with some other friends of ours and you know, drank beer in the middle of the road. And it was hot, it was like 39 degrees Celsius, really, really hot, and everything was packed. We continued and we stumbled upon a lecture by Mickey Rosenthal, who was sort of Israeli Michael Moore at the time, movie maker later became a member of Knesset. And he talked about the problems in Israel and how there needs to be a movement to work through this change and everyone agreed. And me and my friend looked at each other and we were like, yes, this is, this is a calling for us. He's talking to us. And then we walked and we met protesters walking to Levinsky Park, um, protesting against you know, immigration policies. And, and then I understood this was a lot more than just um, protest. This was a movement. This was a community. People were creating relationships, were meeting people, were making friends, were discovering themselves. And that was the first time I knew something changed because I saw, wow, this actually means that we're not only protesting, we're not only, you know, we're not only um, holding up signs, we're actually at the same time as we're saying what we want to see in the world, we're creating something amongst ourselves. So at the time, um, and this is sort of like a, a video that I think sort of, um, you know, shows the atmosphere at the time in the 2011 um, uh, tent protests. And as you see, it, it was so colorful. It was like, and I had been to a lot of protests in my life. Ever since I was like 14, I started going to protests. I've been going to like, you know, 10 years of protests, and this was like nothing I ever encountered. Because what was happening in the tents, not in the demonstrations, was the dramatic event. You know, what was happening between the people. Um, and I think 
you know, you can see people just going up and down the street. It was just like a crazy village of change. So going forward, um, at the same time, I was starting my studies um, in informal education and history. Um, and I had to write a paper uh, and for one of my uh, courses. And I decided to write a paper about the roles and expressions of informal education during the tent protest of summer 2011. Um, basically, um, my main thesis for this paper was that informal education has a crucial part in creating these movements and these communities for change. Um, and I thought like, okay, how can we take what happened in this tent protest community? Let's analyze it. Let's figure out what happened there and how can we um, duplicate it in many other places? And because from that tent protest, I think some people went more to political areas. What I was interested in was the community aspect how to actually build community out of these protests. Um, and one of the uh, professors that uh, we relied heavily on their works was Ruven Kahana. So uh, Ruven Kahana, um, he's a very important professor in Israel that sort of studied um, informal education and informal, the whole pedagogy of uh, what is this idea? You know, we know what formal education is, schools, universities, but what is the education that happens in between the cracks? When people go to the tent and they meet someone and they learn something, that's also education. What is all this informal education? And Ruven Kahana, he was very um, critical of, you know, the... Um, he was sort of, you know, wary about the deterioration of informal um, structures in Israeli society. And when we're talking about informal structures, which is a you know, contradiction to itself, but an informal structure could be a youth movement, it could be a labor union, okay? It could be an elderly club. It could be any type of um, organization that is voluntary. So even a synagogue in many ways is a voluntary um, group of people, a minion, no one, I said a minion before, no one has to, you know, put that minion together. It's the people who want to come together. So what Ruben Kana said in this site, sort of looked into my study, is that um, one could argue with great confidence that a free and civil society can hardly survive or develop without informal mechanisms and organizations, especially those designed for young people. So basically he said, if we want to create a free and civil society, we can't do it without these informal mechanisms. And I would say even more, without these civil communities, okay? A society without voluntary um, communities of civilians coming together um, cannot be a free and civil society. That's basically his idea. And I tried to look into this deeper, into the tent protest. Um, this, by the way, is a really cool map made at uh, a few years after the protest. And what it did was it actually said, okay, great, there was a 10 protest, awesome. Five years later, let's see what had happened. And these are, I don't know, like 200 different organizations that were all started after the 10 protests. So at, basically what that 10 protest in 2011 created is a network of communities and organizations working in various, um, you know, different areas of action from research to new media, to uh, politics, to um, consumerism, um, legal issues, education, um, ecological issues. Um, it really created an outburst of these communities. Um, so basically, again, what he's saying is very simple. A healthy society, a growing democratic civil society needs these informal communities. And I want to show you how I sort of looked at that. So I studied these 10 protests. And what I saw were a few characteristics that I think really reflect on what it means to be this community of change. So first of all, volunteerism, okay? Everything is voluntary. No one is obligated by law or, or any type of 
you know, command to be part of this. No one is on a salary. Everyone who came to this community, these tent communities, were came for their own, you know, voluntary idea. The second thing is an active social involvement for the common good. So the second thing I thought is that for this to be a community for change, um, uh, the community has to encourage people to be involved, but for like a certain idea, they have to have an idea for what is their idea for common good. Okay, so volunteerism, it has to be from your free will. Second, this community has to have um, a sort of idea of the common good. Um, another idea is that participants um, are active in shaping their own process and self-supervision, which actually means that we, sh we decide together. There isn't a leader that decides for us, but every person who is part of the community is actually the person who is shaping its own process. And the fourth idea is the multi-dimensional activity, which means to build a community for change, it has to really um, deal with a various um, you know, amount of these activities. It can't just be fixated on one idea, one idea, one realm of action. It has to be, you know, take our whole diverse lives into account. Um, so this is what I understand that is crucial for a community for social change. Basically, um, you need to bring the change into the community. Okay, if you want to change the world, you have to create a community that actually changes itself. You can't change the world without changing the way you live. You can't change the world without changing the community you live in. And that's the idea of tikkun olam b'mablechet shaddai. Okay, to doing tikkun olam, it's not only a spiritual idea. It's repairing the world on the earth, okay, in this moment, in this time, in this reality, and in your life, and in your, uh, where you live. And so basically, um, I continue to research this idea of how to build a community for change. There's very interesting research by Iftah Goldman. I won't go into it in, you know, very deep, um, but it's online. I, I suggest you to go look for it. Um, and Iftah Goldman, he published in 2004 in the magazine Chevra. Um, basically, he tried to say, how can you, what are the 10 basic steps for building um, a utopian a community that also changes the people who are part of it and also changes the world around? And basically, he said there are two main things that sort of um, are threats for community for change. One is said, in fact, we are in, you know, mass society. We're bombarded by entertainment and mass entertainment and things that sort of make us feel small and alone. And the second thing is the market economy. We're in an economic, you know, very competitive economy, and it's hard to come together and work in communities. And he said, so these are these two major threats. You know, the rat race, the, the entertainment, uh, the culture that's around us. How do we deal with this? You know, how do we um, when the economy, you know, says everything is for profit, how do we put ourselves into creating a community? And when society is so mass and we feel like, you know, so, such small people, how do we get empowered? And basically what he says is that a community um, is where individuals meet to, uh, to act and create together, okay? Community, again, is where individuals meet to act and create together. So as long as um, the community relations increase, okay, as long as we have more communities that can, are connected within one another and we create a network of communities like we saw before, like after the protest, we can lessen the effects of mass society on us as individuals and we can build ourselves a place Again, this is very connected to the basic Jewish idea. Why did the Jews create a shtetl? Okay, why did they just be Jewish in their houses, you know, in the towns? Why did they have a need to create this community, the shtetl? Because the community sort of works as a protective dome in sort of some ways. It helps the member of the community have their place that looks like they want to live, but at the same time, they can look outwards. 
and see how they want to change. Now, um, Iftah Goldman, he gave us some really important tools to understand how to look at our history and learn about it. Um, and basically, uh, he talked about three different aspects of community that if you want to see sort of like analyze your community and, and, and set up your community for success, uh, he talked about three different um, um, aspects. So one is interlacement. So how, to what degree is the community, you know, part of the participant's life? Is it something that, you know, like a synagogue, for example, is it something that people go to, you know, once every few weeks, it's a, it's a very small part of their life, or is it something that's very, you know, center of their life? Do they go to the synagogue every day? Do they organize events? Okay. The other thing is the purpose. So what is the purpose of the community? Is the community only looking to, to work for the benefit of the members of the community, or is the community looking to impact the world around it? Okay. What is the purpose? And the third thing is cooperation. Um, what level of cooperation is exists between the community? Okay, is it a community that you know that people just come and participate and and no one takes responsibility for one another, or maybe they have some kind of you know like economic responsibility for each other? Like if one of the members of the community is sick, do the community members take responsibility for it? And he sort of created this really cool uh, graph to sort of test your community. So again, interlacement, is this a community that the community is an essence for itself? Okay, like sort of, let's go to the synagogue. Is the synagogue a central place of my life or is it like more like a project? Now it's not a question of good or bad, but more of a question of understanding where your community is at. The second one is purpose. So freedom society or, or freedom from society. So let's go back to when I was at this lunar base and we were thinking, do we work for our utopian society on the moon or do we help um, improve the place for Earth? It's these two things, okay? Am I sort of like a isolated, um, you know, sort of like a free society living on the river of these like 20 people um, only care about us or are we a society that's working to better our neighborhood, our city, our country. And the third one is cooperation. So deep and instrumental. So again, I would say instrumental is that we cooperate for like an instrumental purpose. So maybe we cooperate because we're doing a certain project. And deep is if we're actually in some kind of deep connection with one another. So if we go to the minyan, are we cooperating just so we can do a, you know, a service? Or is this minyan, this you know, congregation, really a, a collection of people that have deep relationships with one another. And so basically, when you're trying to build a community for change, you can also always go back to these three characteristics and check your community, check where you're going, check what you want to build, understand sort of um, what kind of change you want to create. And it's not all has to be the same, but you have to use these characteristics to sort of check yourself. And basically, uh, Iftah talks about um, three threats for the community. Um, when he talks about, so what are the things that can sort of damage our, our attempt to create a strong Jewish community that creates change in the world? And so he talks about these three threats. So one is imitation. And when he talks about imitation, basically what he's saying is that um, if we only recreate the bad codes around us, you know, the bad sort of codes of society, then we won't really be able to change what's around us, okay? Um, if, for example, we want to change, um, you know, the ecological system or the way people treat their environment, we have to make sure that we don't just imitate the way people treat the environment in our community, but we actually create an alternative. We actually do something different, okay? We can't expect to change the community around us if we actually just imitate the bad um, codes that we actually want to change. The second thread that he talks about is particularity. And when he talks about particularity, he says that, you know, every group has their own interests. Every community 
might sort of feel, hey, you know, it's us against the world. Um, and basically, his um, warning is that if the community is basically saying, well, we're only going to make things better for ourselves, but not for the people around us, then basically we're not doing anything different. You know, we're basically just taking care of our own group at the expense of others. You know, it may look better, but it's not, it's not very different from what's going around. If at the end we're just, you know, benefiting our small community, but we're not really thinking of how what we're doing uh, can help others and maybe be a relative um, structure for other people, um, we're not going to change what's happening around. We we'll maybe feel a little better with ourselves. <clears throat> and the third thread he talks about is escapism. So if we build a community that's basically, you know, not looking at what's happening around in the world, okay? So let's talk about like a Jewish community. If our Jewish community is basically just a group of people who are really, you know, um, unaware of current events, unaware of the issues, um, staying away from anything happening, you know, not listening to the news, not involved, not engaged, then what's the value of this community, okay? How is this community going to create any change on, on the world if we're just escaping from the world? Okay, so it says you need to make sure that your community is not an escape, but a community that's looking to be engaged. <clears throat> so that's basically um, the basic foundation for how you create a community for change. And I want to talk about a few examples in the 10 minutes we have left. Um, for sort of, I think, what I tried to do, because I think the basic cry that we have today for ourselves, when we're thinking about how in our Jewish world, and this is, you know, a hard time was the coronavirus. Um, how do we create an answer for what we're seeing around us? And the basic thing that I always go to is to organize. Okay, so when we're individuals, you know, we're weak or we're weaker. But when, even as individuals, when we come together, we can actually tackle really, really big issues. And uh, I want to talk about two specific communities that I'm involved in and talk about how they sort of create um, an imp impact on the world. Um, because when we're trying to think about what is the change our communities need to do, I want to talk to you about um, Siegmund Bauman, who was a very important philosopher in the 20th century, passed away a few years ago. Um, and Zygmunt Bauman, even though he's extremely old, okay, he was in his 90s when he passed away. Um, in the past decade, he sort of became a um, guru, I would even say, for a lot of these young people from these young movements that started in 2011 all around the world. And so a few years ago, um, believe it or not, this nine-year-old guy with a pipe was in a reggae festival in Spain. And in between, you know, the music and the, and the partying and everything, there were these like sessions and he was talking there and um, thousands of people were listening to him. And basically um, a woman asked him what he thinks about the protests in, uh, in Spain. And basically what he was saying is that, listen, I think you need to stop doing these protests. And he was saying, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, looking down on what you young people are doing, you know, with all these protests and these online um, um, active activities that you're doing. But basically, he thought it was a bit misguided, you know, using um, all this energy for creating, you know, solidarity for this one event. So you create a great protest and people have a sense of coming together. But in his calculation, we need to create a grassroots movements, you know, that um, actually address everyday life. We have to make new institutions, new ways of everyday living, society through mutual credit, mutual help. And basically what he says, you know, a Twitter message to your neighbors, come to the square, it's fine. But um, basically now I'm gonna read the, the bolded text. He says, I'm not a prophet. 
I avoid making prophecies, but one of the few certainties which I would take to my grave is that the 21st century will be dedicated, whether you like it or not, to the building of new ways of human life. Basically what he's saying, if we want to create a better world in the 21st century, we need to build new ways, new communities that will not create one-time protests, but will create a difference every day um, in our actual lives. Um, and I want to talk about two communities that I'm part of. They're not necessarily the best communities, but they're in my community and the place I sort of found a way to be part of. So one is the urban kibbutz, which um, I'm part of an urban kibbutz here in Haifa. Uh, we're about 130 people here in this neighborhood who live in apartments all over the neighborhood here in Hadar neighborhood. And basically, uh, we also have sort of shared lifestyle, we, we meet, we learn together, we do different um, social activities in the neighborhood. Um, and all the people of the kibbutz are very involved. So some are teachers, some are community organizers, some are social workers, um, some are working you know, with um, uh, welfare institutions. Everyone's trying to be involved in some kind of uh, active work that's creating a change. Um, while we're creating a community for ourselves. So it's very you know, similar to the classic kibbutz, but instead we're doing it here in the city and trying to, to live together. The second community I want to talk to you about is Hakel, which without talking too much about it, but Hakel is an international network of Jewish intentional communities. So basically I'm part of this uh, organization where we work in 35 countries all over the world with more than 130 communities. All these communities we founded in the past years uh, where the idea was that more and more Jews, especially Jews in their 20s or 30s, are not finding themselves in you know, the classic um, institutions of the Jewish world and they need new communities. And you can see all around the world we help form these communities that are focused about learning, about culture, about relationships, about religion, uh, but each community in their special way. So one community might focus on Jewish farming, another community might focus on collective living, another community might focus on being Jewish educators, and another community might focus on Jewish literature. But the idea is to create these communities all over the world, and they're all very based on the ideas that I talked to you about in this webinar of how to create a community for social change, how to create a, a community that not only takes care of the people who are inside of it, but are actually taking care of the society around them. Um, you know, when we're talking in Judaism about being an amsgula, okay, ogla goim, to being an exemplary people, a people who are a lighthouse for the nations. Uh, when we build our communities, in my opinion, these can't be communities that are only taking care of themselves. They have to be communities that are looking out for the whole society. Um, I'd like to give an example, you know, from things that are happening now, I'll go back to my urban kibbutz. So here in Haifa, we're now dealing with the coronavirus, you know, outbreak. And um, a week ago, me and a few friends of mine here in the neighborhood were thinking, so, so what can we do? Because we have a lot of solidarity systems in our community, but we're part of a neighborhood of you know, 40,000 people and a city of 200,000 people. And so basically we've created a network of volunteers that's run by members from my community and other communities. Um, and we have around 150 volunteers that uh, we organized in a WhatsApp group that are just um, you know, ready to, just like um, be called upon for whatever is needed. So if it's uh, an elderly person who's stuck at home and can't buy their groceries or a Holocaust survivor that needs someone to go buy their, their medicine, or maybe um, a family that's stuck with no food at home and people meet together and cook and, and bring it over there, all while you know keeping the health, Ministry of Health you know, regulations and blood gloves and masks and, and sanitation and everything. But still, we're trying to do uh, a community effort, not to take care of only of our community, but try and take care of our neighborhood, of our city. And that's how I think um, 
especially in these times where we're tested as a society, as a humanity. Um, we can't rely only on our government. And I'm not saying we don't need to rely on our governments, the opposite. We need to rely on our governments and our formal society, uh, institutions to take care of our health, of our security, you know, of our economy. <clears throat> but who's gonna take care of the people who are suffering you know, from anxiety and loneliness now? Who's gonna take care of the elderly woman who, who needs someone to buy her medicine? Who's gonna make sure that as a community, we don't fall apart? Um, so we need to, you know, this is the example of the coronavirus. We need to really count on our institutions to take care of us and of our states to take care of us. But at the same time, we need to know that if we actually wanna make a change in the world, we have to build these civil communities, these civil societies. That's, um, I think our only real way to create um, a true, true sense of change. And I wanna finish with two quotes. One is by uh, Martin Buber, a very important Jewish philosopher and educator. And basically what Martin Buber is saying is that the realization of a real group and true community is depending on the individuals and their individuality, their reasonable essence. Only these will assure that the society develop and renews itself. So basically he says that the only way to develop a healthy society around us is if we create communities that are built of individuals that are looking to bring themselves into this community. Basically, we need to, people need to look at themselves and connect with people who want to, you know, really actualize themselves in these communities. Um, so, as you can understand, he's very critical of, you know, maybe things that we know from the past century of, you know, groups that came together um, but didn't see the individual as its center. But he's saying, no, we need to build communities that are not, you know, faceless collectives, but communities that are built around this, the special essence of each individual. Um, and just, you know, for conclusion, um, I really, you know, enjoy this quote from the late Joan Paris, who basically says, we need to use our imagination more than our memory. And as Jewish people, you know, we count heavily on our memory. We are the memory people. We remember stories of thousands of years and continue to tell them, and that's our strength. But what Shimon Peres is also saying that when we want to imagine a better world and we want to imagine a better life, um, sometimes we need to forget our memory a bit and use our imagination. Um, and yeah, so thank you for um, being part of this uh, webinar. Um, to conclude, and basically what I was trying to say is that community is an essential part of our Jewish tradition. There is no Jewish life or Jewish people without communities that are built into the Jewish life. Um, and these communities, they cannot only be a place for ourselves to live in, but they can actually also be a place and a tool to create a change in the wider world, world through uh, using um, a community that's not only acting on society, but actually living in a different way without isolating itself, without taking care only of themselves, without escaping real reality, and without only treating the community as a project. But if we actually immerse ourselves into these um, efforts, we can actually build a society that's built on solidarity, on equal opportunities, and making sure that no one is left behind. Um, and there's a community out there for everyone. And if there's not, you can build one, and people will surely join. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for being part of this webinar and keep safe, wash hands, um, stay at home as much as you can, and have a great week. See ya.